Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Poppy Freita of SAC and I'm your host for this evening's webinar, which is the final in a series on woodland creation and management as funded through the Farm Advisory Service. So the, we've come from the benefits of woodlands to establishing woodlands and in our final webinar we are discussing management of existing woodlands. So our plan for this evening, we will run from five until half six or thereabouts. And we have a great range of speakers um, lined up to discuss management of existing woodlands. So we will start with Helen Bibby, our very own Helen Bibby from SAC, who is talking about managing native and broadleafed woodlands for biodiversity. We are then joined by Alex Brownlee, who's talking about harvesting farm woodlands and getting the best value for your timber. We have our farmer, Mike Davis, um, who is talking about um, his process and his aspirations at West Nook and Bed Farm. Simon Jacinna um, will talk about the work he's done with Mike Davis on roading, thinning and harvesting. And then finally, Stephen Adlard of SAC talking about managing fagal trees. So we've got quite a jam-packed evening um, of speakers planned. After each speaker, there will be opportunities for Q&A. And if there's time at the end, uh, we can also um, have more Q&A at the end as well. OK, so with that said, I am going to move on to our first speaker of the evening. Our first speaker is um, Helen Bibby. Helen is a senior conservation consultant with SAC, and she has been for over 20 years. She's based in Argyle, and she's working on all aspects of farm management for biodiversity, mostly through agri-environment schemes and woodland schemes. She's also involved in native woodland grazing schemes, um, and monitoring of livestock in native woodlands. So without further ado, I would like to pass you over to Helen for our first talk of the evening. Thank you, Poppy. Hey, yes, as Poppy said, I'm going to talk today just a, a wee bit from my perspective, which is all a, a native woodland. Uh, and I want to start with really why native woodlands are important on your farm and why you should look after them. So one of the main things about having native woodlands on the farm, and a lot of uh, farmers tell this to me when I'm out and about, is that they provide shelter for livestock. And some of these farms say they're absolutely crucial in uh, providing that shelter uh, for livestock. So that's either within the woodlands or round about the edges of the woodlands or against the woodlands. They can also add to your farm income, depending on management, obviously the shelter, uh, can sometimes reduce your winter food bill but uh, also there is grant schemes so depending on the quality of your woodland you can uh, monetize that by uh, applying for a grazing in woodland scheme or something like that. Uh, it of course increases biodiversity which from my perspective is really important. Uh, it's one of the highest uh, biodiversity communities that we've got is a, a, certainly a native woodland. And it's part of a healthy environment which uh, supports farming. And I think these days, if you want to farm in a sustainable way, you need you do need a healthy environment to do that in. So native woodlands can be a major benefit to the farm business, as I said, providing shelter and biodiversity. But also in this day and age, we're more carbon aware, and uh, woodlands are the big thing for providing carbon capture. However, in order to maintain that shelter for the future of the woodland, you must manage it in a sustainable way. And a lot of the woodlands eh, that I see, especially ones where farmers tell me this woodland is vital for the business, I will look at the woodland and I don't feel that in 50 years or 100 years with that type of management, that woodland is going to be there unless you manage it in a sustainable way. So you really have to think pretty long term about this. So can we manage uh, woodland sustainably with livestock manage, uh, management? Is, is there such a thing? And uh, I quote here from a well-known environmental book, uh, grazing and browsing by large herbivores are natural features of a woodland ecosystem and grazing management should be considered from the outset in manage of seven natural and native foods. So yes, they are part of the natural a woodland balance, but the balance for grazing is very difficult. 
We'll talk first maybe about some of the grazing benefits of trampling. So if you've got a, any kind of livestock in your woodland, especially maybe bigger livestock, then it, it does help control bracken, particularly at the edges of woodlands or where there's a kind of bigger space, it's more like it's in. So by the act of trampling, that will control the bracken. Uh, cattle also create open areas within the woodland, so they'll have preferred areas where they want to graze, and that's absolutely fine. It's nice to have open areas in a native woodland. These are good for uh, certain species, particularly butterflies, etc. Uh, cattle also help maintain an open woodland structure, so particularly in a new woodland, they can stop the woodland becoming too dense in certain places, so they can help keep a varied structure as well. Uh, also, in some cases, if you're trying to regenerate a woodland, cattle in particular are very good for putting in because they can help a uh, seed as it falls to the ground have somewhere to grow. So they can be used as a tool when you're managing woodland to create regeneration as well as opening up the woodland. They, of course, have uh, quite a few disadvantages if you put too many livestock in a woodland at any one time. Uh, browsing can damage uh, even mature trees depending on what density of livestock you've got in. Uh, they can bark strip if they're really dense, but they'll certainly browse and there's many woodlands with a very strong browsing layer on them. They can completely prevent regeneration causing the ultimate loss of the woodland. So there's many woodlands around here that are uh, grazed continuously over a long period of time, you know, over decades, and you'll say, well, actually, they're not grazed too hard, but if they're grazed too hard to prevent all regeneration all the time, then ultimately you will lose the woodland. And the bottom picture there shows what happens if you actually put too many livestock in a woodland at any one time, and this is obviously breaking your the good agricultural and environmental conditions because the soil is running off here at this point into a ditch. So apart from doing that, it's obviously not very good practice for the woodland. And in this case, I know the farmer said he needs the woodland to feed his cattle in the winter. And sometimes you can get away with a really small area like this, but in general, it's really not good practice to have your woodland looking like this in the winter. So correct uh, grazing balance, as I said, is quite difficult and it depends on quite a number of different things. So it depends on, for example, how many animals you are grazing in the wood and how many animals are already in the wood grazing, such as red deer or roe deer. Uh, so the density of your own livestock plus other grazers. Uh, it depends obviously on the length of time the livestock are in the wood. Now, by that I mean are they in the wood all year round or are they in the wood just a part of the year? I will produce a, a different kind of grazing balance in the wood. And also the time of year, so it depends on what you want to achieve, whether you're going to put cattle in, in the winter or the spring or the summer. That depends on what you what your actually aims are. And some of the things I've seen as well is about how how well the animals know the wood. Uh, along with the type, breed and age of the livestock. So I've seen woodlands that are grazed continuously by the same uh, cattle and they know the wood really well and they will produce a very different um, structure in the woodland than if you release you know, heifers into a woodland, which are a bit like teenagers in the wood. They rampage about everywhere doing quite a lot of damage. But you've got animals that know the wood, they tend to know where to go, you'll get heavy, heavier more open bits and you also get denser bits where the animals don't really like to go. So what is right for your wood will also depend on the condition of the wood, the age of the wood, how much grassland is associated with the wood. So some of these woodlands are grazed as maybe part of a more open area and that could be hill ground or you know a field so obviously you can have more stock on if you've got animals that are grazing a lot in the open and are only going into the woodland for short periods of time, maybe in bad weather, etc. So when you're trying to think what is your grazing level of the wood, there is actually 
quite a lot to take into account. And of course, you need to think of what is your aim of the wood? What what kind of wood do you want to maintain? And what do you actually want it to look like? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, but you must always think long term when it comes to native woodlands. Uh, a long term picture rather than what you can see kind of each day or each year. You must think what's it doing to the wood over the long term. So the the balance is correct grazing management of wood is different in every case. You, you may have very different from your neighbour, even with the same type of food, because your aims may be different and your stock may be different and you may be grazing at different times. So woodlands are long-term habitats and if the balance is not correct, the mature meat trees may survive for years, but in the long term, the wood a will not survive and I do feel that a sustainable management of a woodland is something that's well worth considering. After all, looking after an existing wood is a, a lot easier than establishing a new wood, especially when it comes to native woodland. It's actually, it takes a long, long time to have all the components of a native woodland working well together. So, so that's quite different than you know, planting a wood, it takes a long time. So you've got to think about uh, a lot of different things there. Uh, a native woodland supports uh, a lot of species and is part of, uh, you know, the healthy environment of the farm. And just in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to go th through some of the more specialised species that might be residing in a native woodland and that are highlighted by uh, a Scottish forestry strategy. So the checkered skipper is one that is found uh, quite near my area. It's a species dependent on woodland clearings. It's actually only found in a 30 mile radius of Fort William for some strange reason. Uh, although there's habitat in other areas that could be suitable, we think it's because of the microclimate, possibly the amount of rain that's in that area that keeps the checkered skipper there. But it does need these clearings and uh, the woodland edge is often f found in the uh, forest rides going through a woodland. That's where I would maybe see it. Yeah, I also see within woodland clearings that have any kind of open water or wetland associated with them, they're really good for dragonflies and a lot of different types of insects. The reason is the woodland is providing the sheltered conditions that these insects like to fly in. And some of them are really dependent on a, a shelter for flying. And that's why they like the woodland edge uh, and the uh, clearings within the wood. So any kind of open water, that could be slow moving open water uh, or lock-ins within a wood, or you know, wetland areas can be really important for these kind of uh, vertebrates. Black grouse is quite well known as a woodland edge species. It, it, it actually needs a mixture of woodland edge, open heath and bog uh, for feeding, and it goes into usually quite young woodland. It will use uh, for roosting at night, uh, but it certainly likes open woodland about. A red squirrel, another well-known species of woodland, it tends to like a mix of broadleaf and coniferous trees, but it does require a good quality woodland and quite stable woodland. So it uh, struggles a bit in a, in a short rotation um, conifer coppice. Pale bordered fertility, again identified as Scottish forestry strategy. It's a butterfly of sheltered, sunny woodland glades. It is one of the fastest declining butterflies in the UK, and it does depend uh, on woodland age, again, for the shelters that the trees are given. So, a uh, recommended grazing levels of woodland. Now, this may seem really low to you, but if, what I've tried to say is, that it depends on a large number of things. So it depends on, you know, what what type of wood, what you're wanting to achieve, what, uh, you know, how much open areas is being grazed with the wood. So it's not, um, it also depends on, you know, you might get away with higher for a few years, but then you might want lower for a while to keep some kind of understory in a wood. 
And so there's no hard and fast rules of exactly what livestock units you should need in the wood. It's about looking and seeing uh, the good things and the bad things that the stock are doing and uh, thinking definitely in the long term about that. Okay, so a well managed by a diverse woodland, its open areas provide important shelter for a whole range of species. That's one of the most important things you can do. And if you manage your woodland in a sustainable way, then I think it will be an asset on your farm forever, pro providing all these things. It's a lot cheaper than a, a shed which needs maintenance, but you do have to look after your native woodland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, Absolutely, it sounds like it's quite a tricky balance to to get right. Um, we had actually we've got a little agroforestry group on the go at the moment, and one of the members of the agroforestry group, she runs this How Mill on Twitter. Um, she actually rotationally grazes her cattle, or mob grazes, she calls it, and uh, so they're moved often like every on a daily basis. What are your thoughts on that in terms of preventing the damage to the woodland? Yeah. Well, I think it depends what you want to achieve and, and what your woodland's like, but uh, I don't think there's any problem in having quite high stocking levels if for a short period of time. And quite often you can do that in the winter as long as your ground's not too soft and therefore you get poaching. And maybe in a dry wood you could get away with the kind of mob stocking for a, for a short time and then leaving it with no stock for summertime and spring and that lets you know the woodland flora develop and yeah know, absolutely yeah, so. yeah and I got, I got that from her like it was the fact that she was being quite flexible according to the conditions and and the woodland as you say was a great asset in, to them in the winter great if anyone else has any questions I'm the one asking the stupid questions here by the way so if anyone else has any questions please put them in uh, to us I've got another question through and um, what breeds of cattle do you recommend for grazing woodlands Okay, well, mostly the ones I see around here are mostly ling, but it tends to be the smaller, kind of more uh, native, uh, kind of older varieties, uh, Galloway or Aberdeen Angus that I've seen in, in woodlands. But, you know, Highlanders or ling are absolutely fine as well. Okay. Yeah, smaller. Yeah. So that kind of puts your stocking rates a little bit to put that the, the maximum level. I worked out roughly about a sheep to the hectare. I know we're normally talking about cattle, um, which with those smaller types, probably about six to seven of those to the hectare, I would say, as a maximum. It, it's certainly it, it's certainly very low. And so if you've got your cattle in on a permanent basis, some of the woodlands I've seen here where they have cattle in on a permanent basis, uh, they are running them over quite a lot of hectares of woodland. But they've been doing that actually for generations and the woodland is one of the top biodiversity spots around here and yet they've always had cattle in them and if, as long as they don't up their cattle numbers too much then the woodland will be there. Good. Okay, great. It's a balance. Um, and we've got a question from Alex, one of our speakers. Does coppicing have a place in uh, semi-natural woodlands with grazing? Um, it, it does have a place we've obviously got to be very careful. Uh, so I think as far as I know that when they were cobsing woodlands around here in the past, then it was imperative that they keep grazing out. But uh, woodlands will grow really quickly from a coppice. So although you have to exclude grazing or heavy grazing at the start, because the new shoots of a coppice woodland uh, will be quite tasty to eat for most species. It doesn't actually take long for that coppice to outgrow the reach of animals because you're already, you know, you've already got the root of the tree there. So actually you get kind of super growth and it will grow really quick. So I think you can, but you have to be aware uh, in your coppice cycle that maybe during that time you have to keep a uh, livestock out until it until the coppice it's above them again okay yeah a lot to think about um, and then Stephen who's uh, Stephen Adlard from SAC is asking any tips on how to monitor whether you are grazing your woodland sustainably any indicators ah that's a good question uh, um, I would be looking not just for the health of the trees but also the health of the understory under the 
you know, under the wood, and that's maybe the shrub layer. I'd be looking to see if you have got any regeneration. Now, it's not all about regeneration, but at some point in the life of the wood, some of it has to regenerate somewhere. But there, it can actually happen quite quickly. And as long as that happens every 50 or 60 years, that there's some re regeneration of the wood, then that's fine. So I think you'd be looking at a whole range of things. You don't want to see the vegetation too short all the time under the wood. If it's short for a while in the season, and then gets going, that's fine. Uh, but certainly the shrub layer, uh, I think it's some of the monitoring is looking at, uh, you know, is there regeneration? And is the regeneration that's there actually getting away or is it getting nipped off all the time? So therefore it's sitting there, but not actually going, producing your new wood. So you don't have to have your new wood growing all the time, but you do have to be looking at the balance and the range of species there. The range of species, that's that key. Will there be some species that will probably be more resilient than others, I guess, to livestock? So um, oh. Yes, to, to livestock grazing, uh, there is some species, I would say, that are less resilient to others. So uh, young holly, for example, is one of the first things that can be taken out of a wood by livestock. So if you're... If you've got good growing holly in the wood, you don't want too much. That's that's a way to say, well, actually, it's good to have livestock in there. But if you have some, then you think, well, I'm not overgrazing this because the holly's getting away. Because if you've maybe got just birch and it's only birch that's getting away, it's one of the less palatable species, then you think, well, actually, I need a bit more diversity here. Why am I not getting anything else in this wood? And that could be because your grazing levels are slightly too high. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Helen. Interesting. Um, what we will do now is we will move on to our next speaker of the evening, Alex Brownlee. Alex is the Managing Director of an independent timber merchant, so a r Brownlee Limited. Uh, the merchants are involved in forestry, harvesting and marketing, as well as agriculture. Over the last two years, he's gradu they have gradually grown activities with a particular focus on timber harvesting and marketing in South Scotland and North England in both softwood and hardwood segments. Alex also provides consultancy services in timber processing. So Alex seems to have had a very extensive career specifically in forestry and forest in the forest product sector. So um, it was a great pleasure to bring Alex to the uh, front now. So thank you very much. Well, well, thanks very much for the introduction and the opportunity to, to speak on this particular topic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run through these seven subtopics and hopefully provide some further food for thought for those that have joined us this evening and uh, share some of my own insights. Uh, and, and I think hopefully uh, draw some, some, some links with uh, some of the other things that you'll hear from my fellow panelists and indeed I think one of the, the, the points that Helen just made was about the, the long-term nature, uh, and we certainly see that uh, has an influence in terms of, of timber harvesting and uh, extracting value in, through your timber products. Um, to start with, um, it's worth looking at why, uh, why farm woodlands exist in a wider context than purely for uh, timber production. By understanding this, it helps in the decision-making about when to harvest woodlands. Woodlands utilise a finite resource being land on a farm and have a direct and indirect impact on the functions of the farm by their presence. As well as for timber production as a source of income, we now see more timber produced on farms as a valuable source of energy with the increased amount of biomass boilers installed. Other important objectives uh, can include shelter for stock, as we've heard, sporting benefits, landscape enhancement, general recreational purposes, the ecological benefits, enhanced capital value of the farm and its entirety, and indeed a source of uh, solid timber for use on the farm, such as fencing and, and, and the new uh, or relatively uh, new benefit in terms of a carbon sink, which is gathering momentum as, as markets develop. However, it is also worth noting that woodlands have been seen to have a negative impact if badly planned, fallen out of management or a source of cost rather than revenue when timber markets have been in the doldrums. Fortunately, while historically timber markets have and will continue to be cyclical in nature, the underlying value of timber has seen a positive trend recently. 
So what is the timber value within a farm woodland context? In order to answer this question, like other farm generated produce, we have to look at the market potential at both a macro and a micro level. And dealing with the macro influences first, it's helpful to look at timber as a raw material that is traded uh, locally, but its value is impacted globally through uh, influences such as the global demand for wood fibre for construction, pulp and paper, energy, etc. Population growth and the increased global wealth driving significant demand. UK's timber requirements still being import dependent, with roughly 60% of the UK wood fibre coming from imports. That is a decrease from a uh, historical 80% level in the not too distant past. Major economic events such as the crash in 2008-2009. Currency exchange rates, and from the UK perspective, the Swedish krona and the euro being the two main, most significant. Regional supply and demand dynamics on a global scale, and China being the new kid on the block, affecting all forest producing regions such as the Russian Federation, Southeast Asia, and Europe. Major, major natural events such as pests and diseases, major wind blow, and of course, COVID-19. Government regulation, including tariffs, both uh, home and abroad, and market support, and of course, uh, Brexit. Currently, the demand on a global scale is continuing its recovery since 2009, as housing build, house building in the developed world gains momentum again. In the developing world economies, demand continues to grow uh, and the rise of the biomass markets globally. The individual farm woodland owner, of course, in the UK has really no influence on any of those, those macro uh, factors. So turning to the micro influences on timber value in your farm woodland, key drivers include location in relation to the UK regional markets, a range of products such as logs, small roundwood, biomass and firewood, species and what the market is looking for, third party environmental certification of your woodlands, tree and timber quality, which is affected by species, woodland management and site conditions, site dynamics such as soils, topography, public access, active forest management, the scale of the woodland and the age of the crop. Available harvesting and marketing expertise, the possible conflict with other land uses and time constraints, the increased influence of major private forest holdings under umbrella fund managers being able to skew market conditions in some degree due to their scale, and through devolution and the fragmentation of the once dominant forestry commission into its three national forest agencies in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Westminster. What we're seeing at a local level is the same cyclical nature in timber markets, but with a general positive trend. In 2018, we saw what was a bull market until May 2019, when the market overheated, driven by a combination of Brexit fears and a major beetle infestation across much of Central Europe, releasing large volumes of cheap wood into the market. However, the signs of the recovery are there now. Although distorted by the COVID uncertainty, the outlook for growers, I would suggest, is one of cautious optimism. The drivers behind that positive trend include government support through RHI and the country, uh, across the country, providing alternatives for industrial roundwood, albeit in quite a fragmented nature. However, that fragmented nature of that market provides opportunities for growers to seek alternatives rather than the take it or leave it prices of the traditional large small roundwood users. Changing behaviours with the resurgence of firewood as a market in the domestic context, greater interest in solid wood as a construction material, driven by its promise of speed of build, thermal properties and environmental credentials, major investment in the UK sawmilling industry, establishing commit, uh, committed sawmill capacity that must process wood, solid wood products used in the garden as an extension of people's homes, and indeed a supportive administration in Edinburgh for forestry as a major contributor to the Scottish economy. More thinning operations now providing the potential for a surplus for the grower in many cases, and thus allowing for improvements in woodland and timber quality. The table on the right shows in general the positive trend, albeit with the recent downturn uh, to March 2020. But what we're seeing now since then is that the, uh, the cycle is turning again to a more positive perspective. So how do we capture the potential value of your timber? Historically, farm woodlands presented challenges for the owner, as they are often regarded as non-core activity. It is an unknown market with alien dynamics for the farmer. Due to historically depressed small roundwood markets, thinning operations have been a cost rather than a revenue, creating disruption and mess on the farm. So why bother? Furthermore, when considering clear fells, these are often seen as a once-in-a-lifetime activity. And how do you hit the peak of the market? 
when you only get one go at it. Very different to the annual market access with other agricultural outputs. All of the above is further complicated by what type of woodland you own in terms of species, access area, age, thin or clear fell. And then there is the specter of restocking costs. As with most challenges, there is no one silver bullet. However, firstly, I would say that thinning operations can now be seen as a commercially uh, viable to generate a surplus and importantly, improve your woodland. Whether that be for sporting, environmental, landscape or crop stability and shelter benefits, it also provides a means to improve the final crop in preparation for the clear fell harvest by removing poor quality trees at an early stage in the rotation, leaving the best trees space to grow on. And indeed, continuous cover systems or of a similar nature in terms of removing the poor quality and leaving the best to go on. In terms of thinning operations, providing an initial exposure to timber harvesting and marketing by engaging in such operations, where it is silver culturally and economically positive, a farmer can gain valuable experience in building relationships with woodland managers, harvesting and haulage contractors, timber merchants, and the authorities who issue the felling licenses. Most tree species can be thinned in the UK. The produce generated, be it saw logs, bars, which is a small saw log, small round wood, chip wood or firewood, all have active markets across the UK. Typically, you will generate a higher percentage of small round wood and firewood in the early first and second thinnings, and the percentage of saw logs will increase with the later thinnings as the average tree size increases. As a general rule of thumb, little and often is a practical mantra for the approach to thinning. However, avoid leaving thinning uh, activities until too late when the crop is unstable and the risk of premature wind blow increases as the trees within the crop have not had the opportunity to put down the roots and improve their stability. First thinning operations require racks to be cut through the crop, for example, removing every sixth or seventh row, which creates access routes for the machines to extract the produce, while not opening the crop too, up too much. Ideally, there should be some selective removal between the racks to allow the benefit of more space being given to the remaining trees. Harvesting machines, importantly, should be of an appropriate size to cope with the crop, but minimize the risk of damage, damaging the remaining trees or creating damage to root structure, forest drains, extraction rides, or indeed fields to be crossed from the wood. For clear felling, the average tree size will be larger and there will be a higher percentage of saw logs, either as a result of previous thinnings improving the crop or by the fact that all trees are, are har harvested. Machines for clear fell will be larger to capture economies of scale, but care for crossing fields to get the produce to the point of timber uplift. However, before you consider timber harvesting on your farm, as with most activities, preparation is key, and the gathering of information on the potential crop and site conditions is vital. To do this, I really recommend you seek support from either a forest management consultant such as SAC or a timber merchant such as ourselves. Building the relationship over time with these parties will stand you in good stead over the long term, as forestry is indeed a long term business. Information is needed on the crop, such as species, average tree size, volume or tonnage, preferred extraction routes, and timetables. This will give the best opportunity to maximise the value of any offer for your timber by reducing the level of uncertainty for all parties. Ecological information is also a requirement taking account of the flora and fauna, such as trees and shrubs to be retained, the presence of nests and nesting birds, badgers, badger sets, etc. These can all present a constraint or an op on the operations and or on the timetables. Water courses within the woodland or on the extraction route need special attention, as does possible archaeological features, and both have specific national guidelines that must be followed to ensure their protection. Harvest op harvesting operations have increased levels of risk. So hazards should be considered from the early stage, such as steep or soft ground, the presence of utilities, such as power lines or buried pipes, public access, roads, footpaths, in or adjacent to the woodland, extraction routes and stacking locations, as well as challenging trees or wind blow. A felling license or approved management plan will be needed as a legal requirement, ideally before presenting your parcel of timber to the market for sale. These are issued by the Forest and Land Scotland, the type and size of operation being proposed will dictate the length of time allowed for gaining such an approval. Also, what level of consultation may be required as the application is lodged on a public consultation register for a minimum of four weeks, but it does normally take longer. Depending on your timber haulage route options from your woodland, 
there may be a requirement to proactively consult with local authorities and others on road transport routes. And time should be allowed for these processes. Farm woodlands come in all shapes, sizes and locations within a farm. They provide multi-purpose benefits, as we've heard, and as a result, are often found to contain a range of species, both broadleaf and conifer. Shelter strips are the most common and typically surrounded by productive farmland. As a result, they will have a high percentage of outside trees, which can often be challenging due to the poor tree form or individual trees leaning over the woodland boundary. Fences and walls are commonplace, which are vital to the working farm, but often present challenges to timber operations. And thus, a clearly understood plan of operations is essential before harvesting begins. Extraction routes across productive fields is also a challenge, and time of operations can be vital to coincide with periods out with cultivation, agricultural crop harvest, or when stock are in fields. The uncertainty of the British weather further narrows the window for timber harvesting and extraction. Farm woodlands historically have been planted in parts of the farm that have little or no agricultural value, such as steep banks or wet ground, increasing the challenges and costs of the harvesting operations. Ensuring suitable stacking place uh, space for the produce and safe access for timber lorries to load must all be considered. And it's a normal practice uh, for stacking and loading space to be prepared with stone being put down by the owner to allow for the build-up of roadside uh, produce and for lorries to leave the public road for safe loading. Planning and preparation of operations, targeting a workable timetable, and ensuring the correct uh, harvesting people and equipment is being deployed will all aid in ensuring your operations progress with the minimum of impact on the wider farm unit. A farm wood, uh, as farm woodlands are embedded within a working farm, the challenges faced are a mixture of crop, site, location, weather, timing, available expertise, and timber market dynamics. Although farm woodlands provide a range of benefits to the owner, a strong driver for harvesting timber must be to generate income. The quality of the crop is often established by historical decisions on species planted and the amount of forest management that has gone into the crop in past years. Active forest management will make a material difference to the quality and the value of the crop at the time of harvesting. The specifics of the site, such as slope or ground conditions, all have a direct impact on cost of harvesting and thus potential return for the farmer. Through active engagement in forest management and the development of relationships by those activities helps ensure potential and suitable customers are available to purchase and work challenging stands by reducing uncertainty. Similarly, the location of the woodland earmarked for harvesting within the farm will have its own harvesting and extraction challenges. If woodland has been managed, then the potential crop value will be enhanced. Available and suitable customers will have an understanding of the need to work with the specific farm operations, and a dialogue and optimum timetable for all should take place. Through the process of active forest management, the farmer will also develop an awareness of available expertise and suitable equipment required for their specific parcels, such as hand cutters, low crown pressure forwarders, tractors and winches. While weather conditions, as I've said, are something we all know are out with our control, the planning and timetabling of harvesting can reduce the potential risk of wet weather or high winds impacting on timber operations. Farm woodlands will continue to play an important role in the UK forest product sector, albeit with their own specific challenges and benefits for the farmer and those that work with them. National and international regulations are unlikely to get any less, so aligning with parties that can help support and, uh, any proposed operations is strongly recommended. It's difficult to see why timber markets would change from their cyclical nature, but the trend on price over the medium term is positive. With the improved price structure for the reasons covered earlier, allowing for more farm woodlands to move into the viable category, and indeed brash recovery being the, the branches and the tops of the trees is a further improvement uh, for the right site and should generate a small additional surplus, surplus, but importantly for the owner, should reduce the cost of restocking. Indeed, in, some, in the short term, as the country begins to emerge from the COVID-19 impact, we are seeing a slightly more positive outlook with saw log demand described as strong, although small round wood is proving more challenging. Brexit will indeed remain a major influence on currency exchange rates and therefore the value of the UK grown forest products in Roundwood. To leave you with something to consider, the final point on this slide shows the cyclical nature of imported 
of the import market for sawn wood, which has a direct and opposite correlation with domestic uh, timber demand. What we see here is in 2018, there was a major downturn in imports uh, and an opposite trend for domestic grown wood where demand was very strong. This trend was then reversed in 2019 when the market overheated uh, and uh, sawn imports rose. But where we see today in 2019, while undoubtedly this increase, uh, uh, this uh, decrease, sorry, in imported timber is uh, skewed by COVID-19, is also heavily influenced by uh, the weakness of the pound. Uh, and, I, and I would uh, certainly push the idea that we're heading to a more, a, a more a positive position in terms of domestic market demand. Uh, thank you for the time to cover this uh, this topic, and I'll hand over for questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. It's almost like you've given us a full-on manual to successful uh, harvesting of farm woodlands in, a, in, what, 15 minutes. So thank you very much. And just to reassure those that are trying to digest all this information, um, Alex and our other speakers have kindly uh, agreed to make their presentations available. And so we will make them available um, online for those that need to get that bit more detail from them. So thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them in um, the questions panel. I have one so far. So um, would it be possible to give a bit more information about brash recovery, such as the best way to do and where markets are? So, so brash recovery certainly um, it, it, it is very much specific to, to sites. Uh, and I think uh, it's a growing market. Uh, it, in terms of, if I, if I answer that in reverse, um, in Scotland, uh, Land Energy over in Girvan, a large pellet plant, are uh, currently seeking to grow their brash recovery uh, requirements and are doing more and more of that, up to about 50,000 tonnes currently. Uh, other players, uh, Woody Fuels, who are uh, just over the border in North Northumberland, are also active in, in South, South East Scotland uh, and uh, A.W. Jenkinson, uh, who have operations throughout Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK, are probably the most active in terms of uh, buying uh, uh, brash. And in terms of the, the process, it very much has to be set up from the beginning. It, it's, it should never be approached as an afterthought because brash cleanliness is, is, is vital in terms of minimizing contamination. So uh, it, it really is for clear fells. It, it, it's oh, sorry, uh, Alex. In most cases. It's really for clear fells, you say? Okay. Yes, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the sound went a bit funny there. Um, do biomass markets take the whole tree or just logs? Well, biomass markets typically will take the top of, of the tree, um, so they are competing with uh, the chip uh, chip wood markets, but they will also take uh, the brash as well. Okay. Fantastic. And then for I'll just give you one more question: Is there much demand for hardwoods in Scotland? Uh, what we're seeing is, uh, in, in terms of what would traditionally be known as poor quality hardwoods, so small diameter often um, material that's generated from previously derelict woodlands has, has a strong market in the, in the form of firewood uh, and there are good markets for that right across Scotland, lots of independent operators out there in the market. Uh, in terms of the high quality logs, there are a number of uh, small hardwood uh, mills dotted throughout uh, Scotland um, who will buy uh, hardwood in terms of species, oak will always sell and is pro probably fair to say at the top of the general pyramid in terms of value. You do get the, 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 the odd specialist in terms of a high quality walnut and elm, uh, where we're lucky enough still to have some of that here in, in Scotland. Ash is, is, is a species that's under pressure because of ash dieback and there's an abundance of it in the marketplace. Uh, but there are uh, individual markets that will take that. Sycamore also, but it has to be felled uh, when the uh, in the winter when the sap is down. And and most hardwoods you, you need to look at that when you're looking at quality. Firewood it's not such a, a problem. Um, uh, yeah. Perfect. 
Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. I uh, very much appreciate that. Um, an excellent de detailed overview of the um, timber harvesting in the markets there. For our next speaker of the evening, we welcome uh, Mike Davis. So Mike farms um, 200 acres of arable plus 280 acres of commercial woodland and their objective is to try and make the best use of assets. So they have biomass boiler heating workshops and grain dryer along with them. Um, oh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Hezohack chipper to make fuel and recently acquired Woodmiser sawmill to provide sawn timber for own use. Uh, Mike also enjoys building roads, using digger and trailers and um, lots of diverse activities to make the most of the assets on their farm. So thank you very much. I would like to pass over to Mike. Thank you. Right. Um, following Alex's very excellent presentation, I'm afraid you've now got the amateur um, I agree with everything Alex has said and not much more I can add to it to be quite honest. Um, I now see some of the things I did wrong on the farm which I should have done better but that's what that was one of his things that he said was you gain much experience once you start harvesting and thinning which is our first experience of this was last year um, but I'll just give you a little bit of general background about how I ended up as an accidental forester, I suppose you would call it. Um, back in the 1990s, myself and my wife, we had no money uh, or very little money, but we both had agricultural qualifications. We wanted to farm, so we managed to persuade a bank manager to give us a modest loan, and we bought a very small farm called West Knock and Bed in Inchin, Aberdeenshire. To make this place work, we had to um, develop broiler shed, grow broilers because we could we knew what we were doing. We thought with that, so we we built a broiler shed and started growing broilers for Grampian Country Food Group. Worked well, but part of our conditions for planning, etc., were that we had to screen it. Simon from SAC, who's the next speaker, I believe, he was pestering me to plant mixed woodland and with a fair amount of conifer in it around the place. So to make the figures stack up, well, there was a grant available. So we said, yeah, let's have a go at this. He told me at the time that I must treat my forestry as any other crop and look after it. Um, I must say I was a little bit skeptical. Trees are trees, aren't they? You know, why should I look after the damn things, the grow, the hide, the sheds? That's all we need. But uh, maybe not quite traditionally. I, I did what I was told. Most farmers, in my experience, a bit reluctant to do that, but uh, I, I'm the same myself. But I did. I did what I was told. We planted the, the, the trees. So there was two and a half acres of Sitka spruce and two and a half acres of mixed woodland. Um, and the Sitka spruce was in one block. So planted the trees. And like I said, I reluct, re reluctantly to some extent followed what Simon told me. Um, so I got the knapsack sprayer out and I got the rifles out. And over the next three years, three to four years, we controlled, the, we did extensive weeding of the trees. And for the next 10 years or so, we controlled the, the deer and the, the massive numbers of raw deer that we have in our area and the rabbits. And hmm, surprise, surprise, it actually worked. The trees grew very well. Uh, the failure rate was effectively zero and of course the bonus of that was that there were no beating up costs and we had a healthy vigorous crop so that gave me a taste for it so roll on several years to 1998 and the grampian forest challenge scheme came in um, i knew of 40 acres nearby which was for sale at the right price um, i did the sums sacked up stacked up so I bought the place. Um, once again, I had a good bank manager. Those were the days when the bank manager actually believed in the people rather than the computer. But that's by the by. Um, so we bought it, planted a commercial woodland, which was predominantly Sitka. I again the followed the look after it, look, look after it like a crop. And guess what? It worked again. At this point, I was hooked. Um, you know, why not do this? Why not carry on doing it? So two more blocks of land were purchased and planted over the next few years, giving a total of over 300 acres of commercial woodland, uh, 40 acres of which has since been sold because we had to get some money quickly to build a wind turbine, but that's a different story. Um, 
except it's maybe not a different story. You look after something and establish it well, get it going well, then it does actually find, a, or we found that it, it had a ready market and was readily saleable. People often worry about that on farms, I think. Like, oh, I've planted trees, I'll not be able to sell it. Oh, it's this, that, and the other. Well, in my experience, that was the easiest piece of, of land that I had to sell. It was sold within six weeks to a neighbor who was very keen to buy it and it allowed us to get a turbine up. So anyway, um, so the 300, the, the, the land we bought, we all planted and it all, following the same advice from the college, look after it, control the vermin, keep it weeded, all the rest of it, and it did very well. All bar 30 acres, which was, was on one of the pieces of ground we bought, and this was at Borough Hill, which we'll go on to later, um, which was planted by the previous owner. And he, rather than doing the look after it like a crop management technique, he used it, plant it and forget it, it doesn't matter. Well, it was two years old or, or a year old when we bought it and was on the point of effectively death because ex-arable ground or ex-agricultural ground it was 4-1 four, four ground. So it was poor quality grazing ground, really, 4-1, four, 4-2. Four, the weeds were just swamping the trees, again, Sitka spruce, and the, 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 they were dying. So we did a hell of a lot of work on it. We even built machines to do sort of dual spraying heads and things like that. So we could spray glyphosate or around the outside and um, laser and other sort of less harmful things in the middle. Um, everything was sprayed over the winter with atrazine, which at the time was allowed. But the whole thing about it was looking after it, we resurrected that piece of woodland. We had to do beating up. Yes, it, it was annoying, but we, we had to replace ones that had been lost but we managed to save a good lot of the trees and that 30 acres within three years was actually looking pretty much as good as the the stuff we planted so maintenance and management do i think pay dividends or it so it appeared so that was where we were we got the job done um but that 30 acres i reckon cost as much money to do as the other 200 200 odd acres in beating up terms and general maintenance it was a bit of a nightmare i wouldn't want to do it with a much bigger block i think it would have been easier just to kill the whole lot off and replant if we'd had to um so anyway so that's that's it do the job right in the first place and then i think the benefits should follow on but like as i said that's just my personal experience so this is where my age comes in so we add on another 20 years or so or getting on that way and again i was getting pestered by simon who was still at the college and saying you really think, need to think about thinning those trees that you've planted and i kept saying oh they can't be ready yet surely not you know sit we talk, we said 21 years and we'll start looking at them in the original plan no 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 you've got to look at them they might even be past the, the stage where they'd be best dealt, thinned and all the rest of it so we went and looked at the trees and hmm, <laughs> I hate to say this Simon I hope your head's not growing too big but you were right again um these 18 year old trees that we looked at at up at Borough Hill at Stricken were very very well grown beautiful straight big trees and you could see the canopy was totally filled um and it was very dark underneath now I, I, I'm not a forester by training, but I, I have got a scientific background. And if the 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 energy for building a tree or building any crop is that is deal is, is light. Now, if the light is only getting to see a tiddly little bit of a tree at the top, it's not going to be putting on much growth. So I think growth rate had probably peaked at that point. And so when Simon said, "Well, we need to thin out the canopy to allow," The canopy to develop for the remaining trees it was perfectly logical and so what we did we we, we, did, we decided we we're going to do a thinning and um, simon did some yield class assessments and it came out well over 30 on yield class which i thought was unheard of because i'd looked at the books and what have you and it seemed as if it peaked at yield class 24 but no this this was off the scale so very again fortunately um just yeah, i suppose sometimes you have you are fortunate there was a grant scheme available for building farm road for building forestry roads um so 
I applied for a grant to build the forest road and I've got, we've got a, a, a slew digger at home and what have you. And I thought, oh yeah, this is cracking. We'll, we'll, we'll build the road and we'll make some money building the road, you know, and then we'll still have a nice extraction route. So we, we started on that. Well, didn't quite work out as expected. I didn't make money on the road. It cost me money on top of the grant, but in reality, that's how it should be. Um, um, but what we ended up with was a beautiful set of roads, which allowed very good access for when the thinning happened. Um, and I do think the price we achieved for those thinnings, which was very, very good, this was in mid 2019. So right at the tail end of the period that Alex has identified when prices work high was very good but part of it we are convinced was because we had a lot of offers it, it was a very good road a very good access and it meant that they knew the transport people weren't going to have any problems getting equipment in and out was no problem there's lots of storage areas so they weren't constrained for space so that was a very good thing to do so we went on to do the thinning and um Yes, we, we put it out of tender, we got a, a price in and we left it to the, the buyer to do that. Keeping an eye on using Simon uh, and SEC just to manage the contractor effectively, um, or manage the buyer who in turn manage the contractor. One mistake became apparent very soon. We had said, I think we'll take out one row in five. Um, which was just an idea because the stuff was quick. We thought it'd easy fill in the canopy and would be at evidence. So we started off in one block of, of about 30 acres, probably the 30 acres we'd actually resurrected, in fact. Um, and they brought machines in which, in all honesty, whilst at the, perhaps at the smaller end of the, the harvesting scale, were still a, a touch too big. And so they're taking out one row and five. But we found that we were getting really far too much damage. Now I better the slideshow, I suppose, hadn't I? If we can. So that was when we planted it, sprayed it, and looked after it. Then this was us. This was us taking a row out. Now this doesn't look too bad. It actually managed fine. Uh, we moved from one row in five to one row in six because we decided, for various reasons, which I'll get onto in a minute. Um, so as you can see, the machines are really quite quite big. Um, that's the sort of size of machine that we maybe should have been using. But on the other hand, I think that's a, a wee bit too small. I think somewhere in the middle would have been better. That's not at Borough Hill. That's just a, a slide that's been put in from elsewhere, just to show that you can get smaller machines. So anyway, we harvested one row in five and then saw there was damage occurring. So we we basically got ourselves, that's the machines that were used. So very tight, the guy had to be good. And that's the damage that we were getting. So we thought one row in five, we're going to have a lot of potential loss in soil log value when those come to clear fell because they will get all the infections in and everything else. So we went to one row in six for the rest of the plantation of a, uh, the rest of the eight acres or whatever it was we had to do. And the theory being that we do one row in six with some matrix thinning in between. And then if the damage does transpire to be too bad, at least we're taking out, we can take out a second row, so we can take out a second row at the next thinning um, and do more in, no, further matrix thinnings. And at least we're taking them out before they get to soil log size and that should allow the rest to develop. Um, I'm not convinced that that's ideal either. And with hindsight, I think we might be for the next place within, which will be next year, probably might go to one row in seven um, to take out the first row, the first thinning. And thereafter, we can um, take out a second row without really reducing the amount of trees in the place. We, and then that will open it up to two, two row spacing, which we can put big commercial machines in. So, so what lessons did we learn from this? And I'm getting near the end, but like I say, you don't really need to listen to me because what Alex said was spot on. Um, He's got a lot more experience than me. I'm the, I'm the just the enthusiastic amateur, really. Um, specify some, what's the lessons to be learned. I would say specify smaller machines for the thinnings, for first thinning, certainly. And accept that 
the small increased cost associated with this, whether it be you're paying it yourself or you've got you're taking a, a slightly lower price from your your, your, cust from your, your customer. I, I would say the in the long term, the increase in soil log yields at Clearfell will almost certainly repeal the additional cost many times over. Because if you're selling soil logs, if you're if you're downgrading a soil log from 50, 60 quid a ton down to 15 to 20 quid a ton, that's a big loss. So you you know if, uh, an extra four or five quid or whatever it is per ton for the smaller machine harvesting at first in, I think would be well worth doing. Like, like I say, think about one row in seven with selective thinning in the matrix, um, and then the second thinning can perhaps be done with a larger machine taking out another row. Think about marketing the timber. Again, uh, mirrors very much what Alex said. Don't just take the first price off it. Seriously consider a competitive tender process and don't, unless you're really experienced and confident, which I'm not, attempt to do this yourself. An experienced agent will make sure that the offer accepted best suits your circumstances, or they should if they're doing their job properly. And I think in general, we're, pretty, we're very lucky in that we do have good consultants in the forestry sector in Scotland. Because the highest apparent price is not always the best deal. And a professionally drawn up contract should set the ground rules for the buyer and the seller, reducing the potential for conflict and making things run smoother. Another thing, as we did, if necessary, build the roads to improve access and facilitate timber haulage. Make plenty of loading and turning areas. We cannot say, I cannot say, because I've got very limited experience of this, that roads will always improve the price you obtain for your timber, but by reducing the Reducing the loading and on-site transport uncertainty, I think you're very much more likely to make buyers interested in your woodland parcel. So that, that's my own, my thoughts on that. And when building the roads, this is from my own experience, please try to let them settle for a year before heavy use if possible. Don't have to, we didn't, we should have done, but the market was there, the price was right, so we went for it. And we can do some remedial patching up. So like I say, the above are my own opinions as a small landowner with limited forestry experience under my circumstances. But when you have a crop that's doing well, any crop that's doing well, whatever it is, it must be looked after. So trees are a crop, treat them as you would any of your other crops. And that's all I want to say. Finally, well, it's not quite all I want to say because I've got one more I want to show you. If anybody's got a bit of ground like that for sale, get in touch with me because I would love to plant some more trees. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. For an enthusiastic amateur, you seem to have had some uh, decent success with it anyways, and some good, clear advice for others. So that's much appreciated. Um, and I've taken a lot from that in terms of treating it like a crop and managing access. I didn't really appreciate the importance of that to make sure you've got the market or the opportunities um, in terms of marketing. Um, so much appreciated. If anyone has any questions, please type them into the box. Um, um, our next speaker of the evening, and, and Mike's just referred to him uh, quite a lot with the experience um, in working um, at Mike's place, uh, so it's Simon Jacina. Um Simon is a senior woodland consultant with SAC Consultant, and he's based in Elgin. Um, after this webinar, he will actually be retiring from SAC to pursue his own interests. It will be a great loss to the company. His departure marks the end of uh, an era, 30 years SAC. And it's him we can thank for setting up the forestry team and at times being the forestry team. His wealth of experience will be greatly missed. So I will just pass over to you on that note, Simon. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Poppy. Uh, very embarrassing. Um, Yes, uh, Borough Hill was one of many woods planted under the Grampian Forest Challenge Fund. This is on um, arable land or um, improved grassland, so rather different from the much of the land planted under conventional upland forestry. Uh, a few fairly specific characteristics, therefore, we, we're getting very high yields, uh, superior quality because we're using uh, improved uh, seed as a result of uh, some decades now of plant breeding, uh, precision planting by machine and good access on easy sites with a short rotation. So um, a little bit different from, from much forestry, and we're very much in the learning um, process. So uh, compared with um, 
Helen's presentation, which was very much about native woodlands, mine is very much focusing on medium-sized, um, very productive um, conifer woodland, where uh, income, timber production and income from the sale of the timber is the main um, objective. I guess the thing to first thing to consider is really is, is the wood ready for thinning or for clear felling um, uh, but uh, the main thing though is whatever type of operation it is is you have to consider before you start the harvesting the access uh, for loading and for timber stacking and you know, that's got to be able to take 44 ton lorries and only when you really have you got the access organized and in place can you then move on to the the harvesting operation uh, which means with these high yielding sites, we need to perhaps assess the site at 16 years of age. At the very least, you're going to need um, a felling license or a felling permission from the Scottish forestry. But in many cases, you will also need a, a management plan. Uh, the management plan is a prerequisite for grant aid for um, infrastructure or for restocking grants and possibly also for uh, some other management operations. So you need to prepare a, a simple management plan, which in itself can uh, include a 10-year felling license for thinning. So it's quite a useful document to have. For road construction, planning consent isn't normally required for work more than 25 meters from a public road, but you will need planning consent for creation of forest bell mouths, you know, access onto the, 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 the public road. Uh, but either way, you have to go through a prior notification process to determine whether or not um, planning consent will be needed. When the management plan and the prior notification and the planning consent are in place, you can then apply to Scottish Forestry for the uh, infrastructure grant for the roads. And that's approved, which is another two or three months later. You then build the roads and the associated structures. Then finally, you can start to harvest the, the crop. So depending on the circumstances, you may need to allow up to two years for, um, to, to pass through all, all of these stages. The forest infrastructure grant is designed for commercial woodlands less than 50 hectares in, in extent. And it covers the construction of forest roads along with associated laybys, turning areas and, and such like at a, a rate or an equivalent rate of 25 pounds 80 per lineal meter of road. And for a Belmath junction, the, the first 24 meters or so, the payment is rather higher at £32.40 per square meter, which typically works out at uh, several thousand pounds per Belmath, because you have the extra costs of applying for planning consent and also tarmacking the, the first six or eight meters of, of the Belmath where it's um, adjacent to the public road. But a very useful grant, and it's made a massive difference to the saleability of timber in these challenge fund woods. So it will include, as I said, the uh, parking and load stacking areas, turning areas for lorries. Um, Arctics do need a lot of space. Uh, the, the bell mouth as well here. And you can see there we required, I think, uh, six meters of tarmac um, by Aberdeenshire Council. And uh, although it's not specifically grant aided, uh, some form of vehicle barrier to control access to the wood is very important. Um, this could be just generally stop fly tipping or um, illegal camping, which is something of a problem at the moment in some areas, and also just to uh, safeguard the, the, the timber supplies at weekends. It's rare, but not unknown for uh, the odd load of timber to be pinched. So what is thinning? Well, thinning is the selective removal of the smallest and the poorest trees in a crop to allow room for the more vigorous, faster growing, better quality trees to grow bigger more quickly. There are many, many different ways of thinning. Uh, this first graphic shows a, a low thinning, such as is typically carried out in conifer crops, where the, the trees to removed, which are colored in red, um, very much focusing on the smallest and the poorest trees in the crop. Many of these smaller ones here, which are very suppressed, you're probably that's removing the trees only five or six years before they would otherwise die and become worthless. You remove very few large trees, uh, removing only those that are perhaps particularly aggressive and competing with better trees or are of very poor quality. 
Uh, an alternative approach uh, is, is a, a crown thinning where you almost work from the opposite end and you, you start off by selecting the, the best trees in the crop and then removing anything that is going to compete with them and allowing the best trees more or less um, you know, uh, uh, open access to the sunlight in, in all directions. So that, that's the general concept of thinning. Uh, repeatedly, every five years perhaps, going into the crop, removing a proportion of the smaller and the poorer trees to focus the, the growth on, on the best trees in the crop. The effects of this are dramatic. Uh, this graphic is from a Forestry Commission research trial for a crop of Norway spruce, 57 years old, where they had um, measured the trees every five years with four different thinning regimes. And as you can see, the uh, block that was unthinned in that the diameter of the trees at 25 centimeters is only slightly more than half the diameter of the trees in the normally thinned uh, block of woodland. And the, the other data from the stand also shows that the, the normally thin wood did have a, a higher uh, total volume production as well than the unthinned wood because so much wood gets lost uh, just from mortality. So the difference in the thinning is that you know, you're, you're either going from uh, producing lots of small, poor quality, um, ungraded trees that are just chipwood for the most part, whereas thinning gives you very large diameter trees uh, which are worth very much more per tonne, you know, two, two or three times as much per tonne. Uh, a concept also for coniferous woodlands is uh, yield class. This is the measure of the growth rate of the cr crop. Um, the, the number is yield class 10, for example. The, the, the num that number is the maximum average annual increment of the crop. So a crop of yield class 10, produces on average a maximum of 10 cubic meters per hectare per annum, yield class 20, 20 cubic meters per hectare per annum, etc. And the Forestry Commission have uh, produced a, a large series of graphs and tables uh, for each species and different spacing requirements, different spa initial spacings. So this is the graph, yield heart class graph for Sitka spruce. And to determine the yield class of a crop you, you have the age on one axis, you measure the height at that age, and where the two lines intersect gives you the, 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 the yield class. The two thick lines here are for the sample plots we have at Borough Hill, and as you can see, it is off the top of the graph. Uh, so the Forestry Commission tables go as far as yield class 34 for Sitka spruce, and we are claiming yield class 36 for the crop here. In which is more than twice, two and a half times the UK average. So um, pretty impressive stuff. Yield class isn't just a, an academic thing to know. It, uh, it then the information on that, working with the Forest Commission's yield tables, then guides provides a lot of guidance as to how the wood is managed, when you thin the wood, how much you take out, and such like. So for Sitka, this table shows for different yield classes of Sitka spruce, the normal age of first thinning. And uh, as you can see, it's quite a few uh, years of a difference. It will be even later for slower growing species such as Scots pine or Norway spruce. The important thing is that with um, the first thinning, there is a window of opportunity. You can thin too early, you can thin at the right time, or if you thin too late, the crop can't respond to that thinning. You, you have a significantly higher increase of wind blow and such like. And ultimately, there's a point at which the crop becomes too old to thin and you've, you, you've um, permanently uh, lost the opportunity. Um, so high yield class crops starting at age 17, which is uh, remarkably young. The yield class tables also give you information and predictions on the uh, dimensions of the timber coming out and the total volume. So th this graphic for your class 34 shows at age 18, we take out, expect to take out about 119 cubic meters per hectare with an average diameter of 13 centimeters, leaving behind a crop with about 200 cubic meters per hectare with an average diameter of 18 centimeters. So as you can see, you're, you're, you're generally taking out the smaller trees in the crop. 
every five years this is repeated and uh, in this case the example is that we expect a clear fell at 43 years of age where we take out uh, 800 cubic meters per hectare so as you can see uh, yeah, very over the rotation if you thin every five years something like 40 40 percent perhaps even 50 percent of the, of the timber is removed in thinnings rather than the clear final felling which means you have uh, an intermediate income a steady income which has the advantage of being tax-free every five years also the yield class guides you on how much to remove uh, the higher the yield class the higher the proportion of trees you, you would remove. Um, to take out 58% in the first thinning is, is actually quite a scary thought. It's, a, you know, it's very, very dramatic. And we haven't quite been brave enough to go to that full, um, quite that level of intensity in, in the first thinnings yet. But the reason for thinning is that the crown is the, you know, the motor uh, that, that drives the, the crop. It's the photosynthesis in the crown that produces the timber. In an unthinned stand, the crown is very small. It's a, it's a tiny proportion of the tree height. And even if you thin the, the crop too late, the tree can't respond, that canopy can't expand. Whereas regular normal thinning maintains a, a tree canopy that is something like 30 to 50% of the total height of the tree. So there's plenty of photosynthesis there going on to produce plenty of, of timber. Conversely, if a wood is understocked or heavily over thinned, you might have branches right down to the ground. So although you have a big tree, it's gonna be heavily tapered, very coarsely branched and worth uh, proportionally less. So th this photo shows a, a, a crop that has, has supposedly had a first thinning. Uh, they've taken out two rows, they've left eight, but in fact, the middle four rows of that probably get no benefit from the thinning at all. It's purely just plundering a little bit of timber, but it's not really improving the quality of the wood. And um, looking inside where you take out two racks, as you can see, you have a, a lot of space, an awful lot of sunlight coming down onto the woodland floor. Whereas um, uh, taking out a single row, you, know, you, you lose less less daylight uh, within a couple of years these branches will have grown right across the rack and uh, enabling the trees to grow on and um, as already discussed with mike yes finding the right machine for the job is hard but a lot of it does come down to skill um, we had particular problems with one contractor at borough hill and they just couldn't quite be bothered we've had uh, on other sites um, other contractors same machinery same spacing and next to no skinning or damage. Sim and it simply comes down to the contractor being much more conscientious and careful and taking pride in, in the work that they're, they're doing. But certainly, yes, there is quite a bit of discussion at the moment as to whether we take one row and six, one row and seven, one row and five. And it will vary from site to site, partly determined by the contractor, partly by site conditions and such like. So to recap, thinning starts at about 18 to 25 years of age in um, productive spruce woodlands and clear felling will typically start at about 40 years of age. Um, prices vary uh, enormously. Um, Eight pound per tonne is considerably less than we've achieved um, in most sales recently, typically in Aberdeenshire where there's a very strong wood fuel market. <clears throat> From first thinnings, we're typically getting 18 to 22 pounds um, per tonne is the normal range. And we're finding that something like 97 and 90%, 8% of the outturn is small round wood. And we get a tiny proportion of saw logs and the prices we've been getting for those are you know, in the range of 20 to 23 to 41 pounds per tonne. Uh, subsequent thinnings, the saw log content will increase considerably. Mike also touched on, and um, Alex also touched on the need to get competitive offers. Uh, these are the results from, from one uh, sale we put out a couple of years ago. Uh, went to about 15 or 18 timber merchants, sawmillers and contractors in the northeast of Scotland. We had four offers. And as you can see, the highest offer is 50% more than the lowest. Uh, we do usually go for the highest offer, um, but, uh, but not always. But, uh, Certainly, testing the market is very important. That's a, you know, that, that's a, a big 
differential in income. So good agents will get competitive tenders. He will analyze or she will analyze and assess the bids and the bidders, prepare a contract, supervise the work, uh, invoice for the timber if required. Uh, most contractors, timber merchants these days are on a self-billing basis. And I think very importantly, in, in forestry, you, you never stop learning. So, you know, we, we learn from each operation and uh, try and apply what we learn in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. And it's great to hear and reinforce that message of uh, the value and the importance of thinning. I've got a new appreciation for that. Um, both you and Mike, you mentioned yeah, getting different offers and Mike alluded to not always the highest value offer is the best. You know, um, could anybody elaborate either yourself or, or Mike elaborate on that? The, the reason for that, yes, the, it comes partly down to some contractors are best than others. And over the years, you get to learn who, who is particularly good. So if, if it was close, uh, I would certainly say, I would go for contractor B because I know that the operator is first class, whereas uh, contractor A you know, can be a bit rough and ready at times. Uh, it also comes down to the size of the machinery. Um, you can get much smaller machinery, but that genuinely has considerably higher operating costs, you know, typically five pounds per ton more, uh, simply because it, it, it is productivity is lower. Uh, but you, you, you certainly can totally eliminate then the, the risk of skinning and damage. And it's just a matter of discussing with the client, you know, do you want the, the best possible price within reason or are you prepared to forego some income in the knowledge that you're going to get an absolutely Rolls Royce, beautiful job that will make a lot less mess, um, but set, perhaps set things up better for next time. Okay, that makes sense. If anyone else has any other questions, please type them in. Um, we had another question on a similar sort of note, but in terms of, um, well, oh, I'll just read this one, sorry. Um, what if you, what do you do if you have a small roadside area of trees, about an acre, um, but they are mature? Do you need a license to fell? Yes, yes, you yeah. need a felling license for um, anything more than five cubic meters in, in a calendar quarter. Perfect. Great. And then for my final question, and sorry, I'm kind of going back to Mike, but it was a question that came through after we'd switched over. When buying young trees, did you approach um, more than one nursery for supply? If Mike's still on the line, are you able to answer Mike that? Mike is still on the line. Yes. Mike is still on the line. And the answer to that one is uh, Simon, because we, when we planted the trees, we actually basically abrogated responsibility to the our agent to do that because they know the market i don't all right okay fantastic the, the, the answer is, is yes we would normally get quotes from two or three nurseries uh, it's partly on price it's also partly on availability of the specific size when you're planting my machine as we are uh size of the trees is is pretty critical you want a, a consistent size of about 30 to 35 centimeters Fantastic. Thank you. Nothing is as simple as just looking at price, is it? <laughs> Great. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, much appreciated. Lots of fantastic information and detail um, to add to the other presenters of the evening. Um, for our final speaker of the evening, and apologies, we are running a little bit over time. The webinar might run about 10 minutes late. Apologies for that. I just didn't want to stop our good speakers midway. Um, but we have, next up, we have Stephen Adelard. So he, Stephen is a senior woodland consultant with SAC Consulting, covering the Lothian and Borders region. He's been with SAC for over five years and has over 30 years experience in forestry, both in the UK and abroad. So I will hand over to you now, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Poppy. Um, so this is gonna be a fairly short presentation and it's really a plea just not to forget the trees outside the woodland. We've done a lot of talking about the value in the, uh, of the crop, of the crop trees in the, uh, within a wood. And it was really interesting hearing Helen talking about using managing native woodlands and grazing within them. And in fact, a lot of the benefits I'm going to talk about um, are very similar to, to what 
Helen talked about for her native woodlands. Um, just on this slide here, this is a, a very attractive farm down the borders, um, but and it's got some nice woodlands along a steep bank, some shelter belts. Uh, again, woodland down a, a steep gully there, but very few actually uh, field trees or edge trees um, within it. And I, and I think it's fairly typical of sort of semi upland uh, farms. Um, I am though getting called out quite often these days um, to actually look at trees, other trees outside the woodland. Um, and part of the reason for that is ash dieback. Um, no, uh, not the only reason though. Now, I think ash dieback has brought uh, trees in the landscape um, more to prominence. It's similar to what happened when um, Dutch elm disease hit a few decades ago. And it's certainly within the borders, it's having a huge impact on the landscape. Um, and there's been various policy documents and so on prepared about how to ensure a resilient landscape. And when they're talking about the landscape there, they're talking about all of wide variety of benefits that it can provide. Um, and basically one, an overall rural landscape that can cope with you know current and future threats while remaining attractive, functional and rich in wildlife. So I say I'll come back to the benefits of, of, of um, trees outside woodlands um, a bit later. Now I've chose one figure here. There were when I was doing research for this presentation there were lots um, and it's basically saying that there are an awful lot of trees outside woodlands. Um, 73 million I think that's a wooden trust uh, research. Um, now what I found interesting there, and I've been trying to find actually the paper where I read it previously, but uh, didn't just before this talk, but a huge, vast majority of those are in England and Wales and less in Scotland. Um, having said that, trees outside woodlands are present in Scotland, uh, even in upland situations. Uh, okay, it's sort of a birch along a roadside here and sort of scattered birch, maybe a bit of a sycamore and so on, um, on the sort of grazing areas, but, but they are present there um, and play an important role. Uh, so the benefits, like I say, this is very similar to what you find um, Helen talking about. So the big one here is a landscape. Uh, often you get little clumps of trees on top of hills and this sort of thing, which play an important prominent part of the landscape. Often they've got some sort of cultural reason behind why they're there um, and uh, it can be, um, yeah, it's sort of part of the local history. Um, carbon storage is, an, you know, as Alex touched on, an increasingly important part of uh, why trees have been planted. And I, I, I just quote one, one bit of research here, which uh, said that not only are the trees sort of locking up carbon in the tree trunks, um, but they also increase the soil organic matter. And this effect isn't just straight under the tree, but sort of spreads out into the agricultural uh, fields nearby. Um, and I think it was French research um, showed that soil organic stocks may increase in the vicinity of trees and hedges by more than three kilograms of carbon per meter cube of soil, meter square of soil, sorry. Um, infiltration with trees, again, I think Helen talked about this, um, trees definitely can increase the infiltration of the soil and therefore um, help as pollution barriers and uh, also with water management and so on. Um, and that can be just single lines of trees within hedgerows. I know Wooden Trust again did a study in, in Wales on uh, sort of narrow belts of trees. Um, planted along the contour and, and, and demonstrated how how valuable they can be in um, yes, it's soil and water management. The wildlife benefits, again, I, I refer back to Helen, she's more an expert than me on this, um, but I, one thing I'll just highlight, again, it's just one example, there are lots of different benefits there, but you know, hedgerow trees are, are particularly valuable, valuable for bats. Um, you know, a good hedge with tall mature trees in it, a diverse shrub layer, um, wide field margins as well, if it, um, it all goes together. Um, 
you know, it provides the habitat for uh, the the insects which the bat feeds on and also provides the roost um, for the bats and it helps connect different areas as well for the bats for the flying. Um, so hedgerow trees are, are, are vitally important for that. Um, encourage pollinators as well, it's all part of the wildlife I suppose, but uh, I think I remember uh, Kate Hall talking about that in, in her presentation on, in the first one of these webinars. You know, mentioned things like actually the value of sycamore um, in providing early um, flowers for, for the bees and so on. And, and you know, that, that's again a vital role that uh, hedgerow trees can have. And actually, fuel occasionally, it's a, you can get some good high quality timber from the trees. In fact, if I went back to my first on my second slide, I think that large oak um, that was on land I used to own. and um, Whenever I had a timber merchant up, they always asked if they could fell that one as well. Um, I never did let them fell it. Um, but tends to be fuel for firewood and hedgerow trees so less quality. Um, and uh, But they can also be cut for fodder uh, in, in certain situations and certain species. Um, now, I, in one of my earlier slides, again, I talked about resilience, resilience of the landscape. And I think that's one of the main concerns at the moment is that We've got a lot of mature, maybe over mature trees in the landscape, and a lot of them, particularly say in the borders in Scotland, are um, ash trees and uh, suffering from ash dieback. And uh, I think if things aren't, if, if people don't actually think about the hedgerow trees, there's going to be a really dramatic impact on the landscape of the borders as a result. And so, one definition. I found of how to create a resilient uh, landscape around hedgerow trees is that 40% of them should be young, and that's classed as less than 20 centimetre diameter at breast height. Um, um, also, you need to select the right sort of trees to plant in your hedgerows. Again, referring back to the, the first webinar in the series, very much talking about the right tree in the right place. That's certainly important. Of the trees outside the woodland as well as within it, and you don't want to be planting a single species. I say there's a lot of the dominance of uh, ash trees in uh, the hedgerows and the borders, and uh, we're suffering the consequences of that now. So do plant a range of species, uh, uh, or encourage the regeneration of a range of species within the hedge. Now, why decline in the hedgerow as well? I've mentioned uh, ash dieback, and also mentioned earlier the uh, Dutch elm disease in the past. Um, also, the management of hedges, uh, hedgerow trees are clearly the management of hedges going to have an impact on them. And if you flail them hard every year, you can end up with a gappy hedge like this eventually and very few hedgerow trees within it. So you've got to think about your management of the hedge um, in detail. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about it in this, this presentation. But also, actually, the, a lot of trees are felled because of a perceived risk um, that they pose to the public or in some cases, definitely, there's an actual risk um, to the public as well. Um, we've had a situation in Sheffield with urban trees all being felled um, on that basis, really. Um, so I'm just going to touch briefly about um, tree safety. Um, one, just to figure, one in 10 million, um, that is actually there to just highlight how rare it is that somebody is actually killed by a uh, a dangerous tree. Um, so the risk is one in 10 million every year, um, which is class is very low. Um, even accidents, which are resulting going to accident emergency from falling branches and so on from trees, that's a uh, 55 per year. Um, I'm not going to talk about how tree safety, but there's a really good document, um, Common Sense Risk Management of Trees, uh, for any landowners who are concerned about their trees, and there's a link there. I think this presentation, along with the others, will be available afterwards, um, so you can get, get the link. Um, and that talks about zoning, so identifying particular high-risk areas, so actually sort of mature beech trees along a public road like this would be, um, so that you'd regularly monitor, do tree inspection um, yearly or every six months in some cases, um, but other areas of the farm, it'd be much less onerous than that. Um, any monitoring you do do, make sure you record it, so any insurers or whatever will have access to that. And then 
if you monitor it and identify something wrong with it, make sure that you act on that. Um, and again, record what actions you've made. Like I say, refer back to that, that document if you're concerned. Um, now, dealing with ash dieback specifically, like I say, I'm getting called out more and more about this. And um, there was a previous question about failing permission. And I'd encourage you to look at getting failing permissions for trees as well. If it's an individual tree, um, it's likely to be under five cubic meters, in which case you can fell without permission. But if you've got a series of them in your hedgerow, it's likely to be above that and you will need a fell permission for it. And Scottish forestry are getting very firm on this because they are concerned about the impact on the landscape if everyone starts felling their roadside ash trees. Um, so even one as badly diseased as this, um, they won't accept that that is an immediate danger to the public. Um, unless you've got a tree inspection which says so. Um, and so you shouldn't really be filling that without film permission. Um, also, try not to fill all your head disease ash trees, ones that aren't a risk to the public and so on. Um, they create valuable habitats, you know, for bats, for birds, woodpeckers, so on, um, and all loads of insects. Um, and so retain what you can, it's safe to plan, uh, safe, safe for you to do so. And as I've got there, have a plan. So actually start replacing the trees you're having to fell uh, if they're becoming dangerous. And that's really what I'm saying now. Don't sit back and ignore those trees. That's my plea that I had at the start. Act now on, on what's there and those are disease and stuff to come up with a plan on how to regenerate them. One thing one document I've seen recommends that if you're felling a large tree, make sure you place, replace them with at least three. This is a large tree on hedgerow and field and so on. Um, medium trees too. Um, small trees, you can probably get away with one. Although those are minimums I'd, I'd suggest. If you've got wildlings within the hedge, um, save a lot of costs in planting trees. So just make sure you mark them clearly so that anybody um, flailing the hedge or, or trimming the hedge um, knows to leave them to grow on. Um, reassess your he hedge trimming, your hedge management. Again, I could do a whole talk on that, um, but uh, try not to do it every year, maybe you know, every second or third year is rec recommended. Again, I've said this already, right tree in the right place, and I think might very much emphasize the need to give them the right aftercare, and that's equally true of trees within a wood as trees without outside the wood. Um, with hedgerow trees and well any trees outside the wood really it's it's good to link with wildlife strips water margins and um, link different aspects areas of woodland and so on and, and that you can see in this little picture this is of uh, trees along a water course here you know here's a boundary there which could have um, been planted with a few trees linking up to the woodland behind um, and then we've got some scattered trees within in the field as well um, again diversify your species just don't go for one species um, if i had more time i'd talk about different species appropriate for replacing ash but um sycamore is an obvious one actually willows and things like that are, are good and actually Willow in particular would benefit from pollarding, which would actually prolong its life. Um, that's cutting it at a higher height regularly um, to basically, we can cut it for fodder and things like that, but it also, like I say, stops the tree from getting too top heavy and, and ending up splitting and becoming wind, um, un 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 unstable in the wind. Um, funding. Uh, Again, this be on the PowerPoint. It, you can get funding under eight schemes. That's the Agri Environment and Climate Change Scheme. Um, that's a complex one to apply for. So if you're just thinking of putting in a sort of few hundred meters of hedges, I very much recommend the Woodland Trust Grant, which is the more hedges scheme. Uh, that's funding for putting in a hedge, but they insist that you put in a hedgerow trees within that. Uh, there are also local grants available. Now, I've got the one example from the Borders, which is the Borders Tree Planting Grant, um, which covers up to 100% of your mater material costs. That doesn't cover planting hedges, but it 
um, is does cover sort of small copses and corners of fields, and within that you can claim some for planting hedgerow trees as well. So again, there's a link there. Um, so do have a look at those if you can. Okay, back to you, Poppy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, it's good to have you at the end to kind of give us an idea of the, the other sort of insights. And I wonder whether even that could be another whole webinar in itself, actually, in terms of hedgerow management and in field tree management. So thank you very much for doing your best in 10 minutes, uh, especially at the end of the talk. Um, we have one question through so far. If anyone else has any questions, type them in. Um, do you think we'll see more woodland pastures created? or reinstated with the push for more tree cover? Well, I'd hope so. I, I think there are issues perhaps with the current grant as it stands. There is a grant for um, establishing, uh, it's called the Agroforestry Grant under the Forestry Grant Scheme for um, establishing trees within pasture um, with individual protection um, suitable to protect against sheep grazing. Um, the, you know, the, there are some issues with that around the cost, the level of grant aid, and whether that um, covers enough of the cost entailed. But uh, it, there's certainly huge benefits to from gain from having trees in pasture. Um, you know, I just touched on some of the benefits in the presentation there, um, and yeah, we could talk about <laughs> a lot more of those. Um, but yes, uh, uh, there's certainly a lot more interest within it, um, and it's about how to get them established in a way that's economic for the farmer. Um, that seems to be the stumbling block at the moment, but there um, certainly it is worth doing if you have got the um, time, capacity, and perhaps money to do so. Um, yeah, okay. there could be win-wins for multiple enterprises, considering livestock and or arable land, couldn't there? Exactly. Um, and Poppy, yeah. Yes, I see that's Poppy, Mike coming in now. I yeah. don't actually have a screen to type anything on. It's not coming up. Can that's I ask Simon, uh, Stephen a question? Yes, please do. Yes. Stephen, um, you say you need a felling license for dying ash. Does that actually apply to what is actually dead ash? Because I, I think it's a bit of a nonsense if you have to apply for a dead tree. No, you're right, and it's it's. Thank you for clarifying that, Mike. A dead tree is uh, you don't need a film license for, um, but a a diseased tree you do unless you can show it's an immediate danger to the public. Um, like I say, there is that allowance which Simon talked about of film five cubic meters per calendar quarter, where you don't need a film permission for permission for. Um, but you know they they changed the rule um, last year, was it, where actually wind blow trees and 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 so on is uh, you need now to get a film permission for, and you know I think part of that is one of the, one of the reasons is the impact of the ash dieback and so on, and and the concerns that a lot of these trees will be felled and not replaced, and it's really a one way of encouraging people um, to actually replace the trees that've been felled. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Fantastic. OK, well, that um, brings us at quarter to seven. So I think we'll um, draw the webinar to a close now. I will just um, um, I would just like to, first of all, thank you to all our speakers this evening. Um, you've given us a really good insight into the planning, the care, the management that's required for existing woodlands to make sure that they remain economically viable and sustainable. So thank you very much. And I hope our audience have appreciated and, and gained um, bits of a lot of information through those comprehensive talks. And like I say, this has been recorded and there will be PDFs of the slides available afterwards um, to help you, as I'm sure that some of you probably had uh, far too much information to, to gather. I know I have anyways. Um, if you would like any further information, this brings us to a close of our Woodland series, but if you'd like any further information, there's more and more resources that are being made available through FAS and they're available on the website there. So um, I hope you forgive me for running slightly over, um, but I hope you've appreciated the talks this evening. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us and um, and have a lovely evening. So thank you very much. I'll bring the webinar to a close now and hope to see you again soon.